Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer in training with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Do you remember back in elementary school when you were learning geography and you were making cutouts of the continents and unconsciously you started matching up the shapes of South America, Africa, and so on? Well, at that instant, you were onto something and that something was the simple spark to the concept of plate tectonics. In this episode, we'll cover the story behind the discovery of plate tectonics, the science of how it occurs, and then we'll finish out this shindig with a look into the past, from the coalescence of Earth all the way to modern day. And also, we threw in a bonus section where we're going to talk about a 50 million year projection into the future of what Earth's land masses are going to look like. With all that on the agenda, we brought in an expert and enthusiast. So with that, I'm happy to introduce Kate Larson. Kate is a geologist and science communicator who is using the power of social media to teach geology in exciting and entertaining ways by relating to her audience. Through her videos, live stream lessons, and podcasting, she explains once complicated or boring topics in a way people can and want to understand it. Since gaining popularity and finding her community on platforms such as Instagram and TikTok, Kate continues to spark widespread interest in the field and inspire people around the world to pursue a career in geosciences. So, now that you've been introduced to the topic of this show, and my dear friend Kate, we're going to head into our first commercial break. But before we do so, I wanted to take a quick second and just promote our newsletter. So the Monday before each episode, we will email you facts about the upcoming episode as well as what information wasn't covered, so bonus content. And then we will display what the following episode will be. So with that, we encourage you to reply to our newsletter with a question that could possibly be answered by our next guest star. So if you want to have your questions answered and stay in tune with the podcast, head to our website under the newsletter tab and sign up today. We look forward to adding you to our community of curious people. And with that, here's our first commercial and enjoy the show. Hi, Kate. Happy to Hi. have you on the show. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. I'm really excited to talk about this stuff. I know. I know. Uh, I was super happy whenever we got a hold of you. Well, my marketer got a hold of you. Shout out to Courtney for that. That was so nice. So um, please First of all, tell me about this TED Talk experience that you just had. I um, flew all the way to California from New York, and I gave a TEDx talk at the University of California, Riverside. And it was a very cool experience. And I got to have my first like in-person speech rather than like giving a lecture, which is what I'm used to. But I got to do like a full-on speech and talk about how we're using science communication um, on social media and being able to not just educate people around the world, but to give representation for sciences that people might not even be aware of, like geology and changing the way people think about it and inviting people to, you know, maybe explore it as a possible career option. That's exciting. Yeah. And it, that's very interesting. Whenever we first met, that's something that came up like almost automatically whenever we were talking. You were like, so many people don't really, they disregard geology. That's so yeah. surprising to me. I was one of those pe people. I did not mm -hmm. like geology. I was in high school earth science class and it was just not an option. I did not like the class. It wasn't being taught to me in a way that I particularly you know, enjoyed. So I didn't consider it. And then also, like, simultaneously, I didn't know that I could do that as a job. Like, I thought that the only thing I could do was be an earth science teacher, which I did consider briefly. But then I realized I don't like teenagers. So I just like, nope, <laughs> we're not going to do that. But, you know, I didn't know that I could be a geologist until I got to college. And it's the experience for many geologists um, across different generations, too. Like we don't find out about it until maybe we're yeah. already partly into another career path. And it's like, oh my God, I just discovered this. This is great. Now what? But I think it's important to have a way to get this to somebody, to get this like representation of like, this is a geologist. Um, 
this is something that you can do if you want to do it. So, so social media is a really great way to get that to somebody and have it find them rather than them finding us. I couldn't agree more. You're a little more focused than I am. Obviously, I, I have to be a lot more broad. This is everything steam. So like I'm doing you know, different videos on quantum mechanics and, and mathematics and, and, you know, I've even done some stuff on art and psychology and, and neuroscience. So like, uh, and I'm, I'm also product to that as being, you know, even 24 now, well, going to be 24. I know a broad range of things just because I'm still trying to figure it out. Even though like I am a structural engineer, I still am like, you know, I know too much about physics compared to engineering, or <laughs> I have a real appreciation for, for environmental science and, and here I am, but it, don't let that stop you either. I mean, for just, you know, pursuing knowledge because it's, it's fun. You get to talk to amazing people like Kate and just in general in life. And that's just, it's so fruitful. It's so fun. I think. And something I tell people a lot when they are expressing to me like, Oh, I want to do geology, but I'm already like really into this too. Geology specifically. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know a lot about other sciences, you know, like physics, but um, geology is a very broad science that overlaps with so many other things. If you have an interest in archaeology and you're like, oh, I, li I like geology too, you can do that. There are things that you can do. Like I spoke to somebody on my own podcast a couple of weeks ago who is a like archaeologist who uses geology. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like you can combine anything. There's even people who do like medical geology where you study, you know, things like um, asbestos and how asbestos uh, affects pe people and you know asbestos if you're not aware is a mineral like it's it is a mineral and we just used it to make a bunch of stuff and now we're dealing with that but geologists are very knowledgeable about how that works and when you do like geobiology you can really all bring it together so you can like mm -hmm. combine so many different things if you have overlapping interests and it makes you more marketable um as a potential employee because you have a lot of experience in two different fields or maybe three different fields and you're able to problem solve better than, you know, somebody who only has one experience having to work with somebody who has other knowledge and a different thing. You're bringing it all together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we weigh and measure intelligence based on neural pathways, right? Imagine a pathway is also these uh, connections between geology or, or physics or mathematics or, or just the different, any any different field. And if you can connect those dots, those pathways, you're a great problem solver, right? I mean, the, the most intelligent people have been able to marry geometry with physics or just, just any, just, just as a, an example. So um, definitely don't cut yourself short, you know, explore whatever you'd like. And um, definitely social media helps with that for sure. Well, as long as you source it correctly. Yeah, but as long as you're all. able to find these kinds of people, and that's something that I enjoy doing also, is when people message me about a specific thing, I'm like, oh, hey, I know somebody who is better equipped to answer this for you, like, you know, answering a question about what is this specific geoscience career like? And I'm like, well, I don't know, but this person does. They can talk to you about it. They are a, a, a professor who has experience in this. You can talk to them. They can give you some, like, guidance, and I, I – for one, I really enjoy being able to do that. And I wish I could do it more. I, I wish I had more broad knowledge of these different career fields and, you know, combining geology with something else. Like I know, a, I know a little bit about it, but what kind of like what that job would be like, I can't say. So I'm, I really enjoy finding those people and connecting with them so that I can use them as a reference and say, all right, Hey, here's somebody. Can you help them understand what it is that you do and how you got into that? And I think that's why podcasts like this are important because you are reaching out to people who are in these like really niche fields and you're like showing the world what they do. And I think that's so helpful because it opens up a lot of um, ideas for, for, for people. Absolutely. And just showing them that anybody's capable of doing it, you know, mm -hmm. no matter what you look like, because we're all human beings. <laughs> yeah. <But> yeah. <laughs> so we're here to talk about plate tectonics right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not to delay too much. But so this first segment is based on discovery and the proof of plate tectonics. So maybe we should start right at the 
I don't know, maybe the very beginning or one of the marked beginnings of this involving Alfred Wegener. Would you like to start there? Yes. So the theory of plate tectonics was not something that people really knew about or cared about. Um, this was back in the early 1900s. Um, there's this German guy named Alfred Wegener. Because it's German, you do uh, a V Vecner, as the W sound because that's, we're, the, we're one of the only languages that calls it a W. Everyone else calls it a double V, which Ooh. is kind of funny. Strike but one for Sam. Wegner, um, he was actually a, a, a climatologist who came up with this theory involving geology and like, you know, the physical earth. And his ideas were really just cast aside and disregarded because he didn't have that, you know, specific background that would, you know, he would, he would need to, uh, to fully explain what he was observing. But he came up with this, this theory of um, continental drift. And that was what went on to become the theory of plate tectonics. But at the time when he came up with it, you know, um, he was putting all this evidence out there saying like, hey, I was looking at, you know, uh, some fossil assemblages, um, mm -hmm. talking with different people around the world, being like, all right, hey, we, we're finding the same fossils from the same species on the coasts of two different continents. And we know that those creatures did not swim or fly. And that was like, that was a really big thing. People were thinking like, did they swim? Like, how far could dinosaurs swim? And yeah. it was like, no, they could not swim that far across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Um, but that was one of the big things. And then he's also like, well, you know what? Maybe they were together because their shapes kind of fit together. They know the shape of South America and Africa. They, you know, they fit pretty, yeah. pretty perfectly. And that's something that I think even even kids recognize that before I was taught what plate tectonics is. Mm -hmm. I remember looking at like a map and I'm like, huh, look at that. I don't like they fit together. And my teacher's just like, all right, we'll get we'll get to that later. I I I suppose. <laughs> but yeah, that was like, my reference too. I was gonna yeah. say that's literally what you do in like the fourth grade, but this man figured it out in like 1912. And also one thing, uh, the the people who refuted what he was saying with this continental drift, he was they kind of thought that there was land bridges at the time, and that's what brought these um animal species or just, you know, yeah, animal species to and fro from the, from the different coastlines. But then they were like, but then uh, um, Alfred was like, but what about plants? I don't, that's, that's not how that happens. Cause like there's yeah. different ferns and all different in continents. How do you explain that? But sorry, continue. I think that's, that's also, I, I hadn't heard about that specific theory, um, but I had heard about the expanding earth theory, which is something that um, was kind of proposed around, a, a little bit after this, I'm not sure exactly when it popped up, but it was this idea that, all right, well, I guess the continents were together once because that would explain, you know, the fossils and the plants and, and all that. Oh, you much like the universe, which in 1920 we discovered is, um, you know, expanding. I think That's it was old. 1920. Um, we discovered that, that the universe is expand, expanding. Mm-hmm. That can't be right. I don't think it's 1920. That can't possibly be rewrite. It was Edwin Hubble, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe it maybe it was 1920. Somewhere in there, yeah. Somewhere in there. But no. we thought we're thinking like, oh, if the universe is expanding, maybe the Earth is expanding also because think about when you draw a you know a bunch of little dots on a balloon and then you blow it up, and that's the that's like the analog or the um like the model that we were using to explain the expanding universe. So we're like, all right, well, maybe the Earth is expanding and it's pushing all these continents away from each other. And that was a theory for a really long time. And there are still people who believe it, um, even though it's so been strange. debunked. And it's like their <laughs> idea was like a very drastic change in the Earth's size. And we know that that wasn't we know that that wasn't the thing. I think it's funny, though. There yeah. are people who still believe it today, like quack scientists and like conspiracy theorists who have no education whatsoever. Uh -huh. Um but you can actually you can actually debunk that with 1600s level of of education in mathematics math. from Newtonian, oh, just simple Newtonian I, classical physics. Yes, I love that. I, I really enjoy that part of physics. Like I really 
I like being able to calculate like the diameter and the and like the mass of a planet orbiting another body. It's so easy. I don't think people mm-hmm. realize how easy it is. It's like the first thing I learned in physics class. Anyways, <laughs> this was a theory that Wagner came up with and it was not taken seriously. Um, anybody who brought it up was like shamed. They're, they're like, what, you believe that crazy theory? That doesn't make any sense. The reason that it was really you know, not considered is that they couldn't come up with a driving force for why it happened. If the Earth was remaining a constant size, you know, if expanding Earth theory was not correct and it was just, you know, and it was this, the continents were just drifting by themselves without the Earth changing size, then what was causing it? And Wegner didn't have an answer, you know, partly because he was not a a, a geologist or, or um, anybody who was you know, more well-versed in that. Uh, but he died without seeing his theory you know become accepted but later later on decades and decades later people were like still you know not really thinking about it it it, it was just something that it wasn't like everyone was continuously trying to prove it it was just cast aside and that was it and it didn't like pop up again until the 60s um I guess like the late 50s, when a a woman named Marie Tharp was working at this, um, this like mapping lab. And she was working with a couple other scientists who were, uh, their, their like mission was to map the ocean floor by using, um, like, like data that was being collected by naval ships from World War One and World War Two. So she had this really like tedious task of just compiling um like like single lines like single paths and they got data points across a single line and then they were collecting they were she was compiling (laughs) all these different lines and knowing the elevation between the you know this is between the boat and the the ocean floor Mm -hmm. across one line another line in a different direction another line in a different direction and I'm using my hands and no one can see my hands right now. I am <laughs> definitely a hand speaker, but <laughs> all these lines are going around and she is coming up with like a, a, a 3D image, being able to understand what that looks like, being able mm-hmm. to come up with an actual image of what the ocean floor looks like. And she looks at it and she's, she's like, oh my God, there's like a mountain under the ocean. And it's like, a really weird shape like it has this like dip running at the center of it and Mm -hmm. that's kind of weird and she's like well um this is the exact shape of like the shapes that are connecting that would connect the two you know halves of the uh, atlantic ocean she's like all right well if this is like the same shape that matches up to you know south america and africa she's like well my god i gotta keep it on the dl but i think that you know that (laughs) plate tectonics theory might have been onto something yeah so this was like she was not taken seriously for this obviously especially being a woman scientist back back then or even even today honestly but she worked with um these other scientists and they kind of went a little bit further with it and they were like all right well this seems like it could be something. Let's map out all of the earthquakes around the world. Let's just like, let's just see what that would look like. And when they did it, they found that the majority of earthquakes on Earth happen along these little, you know, mountains in the middle of the ocean. Mm-hmm. And that was something very, very big because that really solidified that there is something there there was there is motion happening there Mm -hmm. but it wasn't until they did further analysis and this was like from people who were working with them but then went off and did their own thing in addition to it and Mm -hmm. there are some sources that cite only these guys and i can't remember their names and honestly i don't even think it's important because so many sources will say that they did all of that and these guys really just dragged a like this like device around in a boat to go across the Atlantic ocean. And they were, um, they were detecting the magnetic alignment all, 
all across the ocean. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Is uh, apparently um, the uh, the poles, the magnetic poles of the Earth, had flipped several several times throughout Earth's history, and that flipping was recorded in the rock that makes up the ocean floor, which has some iron in it. It's got it's got metals in it. It's it's um, mid ocean ridge basalt, which is a very a very you know plain mafic rock, and it's got metals in it. So that alignment of the magnetic field was being recorded in these rocks and you drag uh, a, a this device i forget what it's called you drag it across and you're able to see all right well it was facing this way here and this mm -hmm. way here and this way here and then once they made it across the ridge it was the same thing backwards they were equal mm -hmm. on both sides and that was telling us something that oh my god these rocks along both sides of the ridge are the same age. There is new rock being formed coming from this ridge Ooh. all the time. And that was like the final piece of proof that was needed to like, yeah, something is definitely, definitely happening. And that should have been it. Like, I wish that that was it, but there, there was still like a little bit more to understand. Like that really solidified that something, this is definitely a possibility Mm -hmm. And it was starting to, it was becoming, you know, more and more of a serious topic and people were taking it seriously. And around this time, you know, after, you know, um, Tharp and her crew, he's in and whatever, after they kind of put this forward, a bunch of other scientists are jumping on this because they're like, shit, there's some, there's some traction here. <laughs> and so there was a bunch of research happening throughout the 60s. And it's like the plate tectonics revolution. And you can ask like older uh, geologists and ask them like, you know, were you in college in the 70s? And, you know, sometimes if, if you know, if they if they're that old and they can remember that they they're like, yeah, that was like changing. Like we mm -hmm. were still learning things about how that worked. And it was like rapid, like we're figuring out new stuff. New theories are popping up. No one knew exactly yet, but there was still the the issue of of knowing what causes it because uh, just like begner no one really could figure out what caused it we had the definitive proof that it's happening but we couldn't call it like fact until we knew why it happened or have any kind of idea so it's not the expanding earth mm -hmm. that's not that's not it but we were getting closer and closer to figuring it out and that was when we really started to like come up with with these like theories about how it worked out and there was all kinds of people like jumping on it and trying to figure it out but yeah that's um crazy. that's very very crazy i think that's so cool to be to be studying geology at that time trying to figure it out that just sounds super exciting i would oh, i would have been all, all over that definitely and just to slap a little bit of a tag of validity here so whenever um marie tharp was doing her um expeditions I think what they were using, and if the timing is correct, I should be right on this, is that they were using the first kind of iterations of sonar because sonar yes. is um, a, just run by piezoelectrics. And piezoelectrics took a few decades after the Curie family made it in the late – or not not made it, but like understood it in the late 1800s. So that just kind of makes sense because it didn't hit, you know – anything other than the military till about that time, which makes sense. So it's like groundbreaking, groundbreaking technology with groundbreaking like studies. So super cool stuff. And then with the magnetization, of course, we have to understand that every, every specimen has some, some form of magnetization. It's a property of material. So igneous rock, which is what flows out in those crevices that you speak of, uh, has a, a form of magnetization. And since it has a lot of iron, we understand that iron is extremely magnetic. If you, if you actually take it and you run, um, say you run perpendicular to, to this, um, to this depression, mm -hmm. you'll be able to read the repulsion and, and, and attraction as you go across these segments go going uh, perpendicular. So they were able to map out, you know, 
when when this was occurring and they're like this is super strange which we then also have like, like oh. ages for that we literally have ages because we're able to date that rock mm -hmm. we're able to look at how long you know the poles were in this alignment and you know we see that in the in like the uh i guess the extent of like dis distance you know mm -hmm. how how long that um that period was by looking at how much rock was there you know going perpendicular right. over the ridge you're like oh well there was a really long period here mm -hmm. um you know it matches up over here then a short period flips back again mm -hmm. and i gotta mention before it you know anyone gets like super worried because you know you see these kind of these things pop up and um you know, like clickbait articles and whatever. It's like, you know, we're overdue for another magnetic pole reversal. Like we're not overdue. If there's ever a time where you read an article that says we're overdue for some kind of natural phenomenon, do not believe it. We're not overdue. Mm -hmm. We don't have the ability to, you know, perfectly estimate how long these cycles, you know, yeah. last and taking an average as you know, Earth's history has gone on, it doesn't always apply. So we're not overdue for a magnetic pole reversal. It can happen. Mm -hmm. Just like Yellowstone can erupt when we're not overdue for it. Just don't <laughs> get yourself, don't be, you know, led astray and, you know, fear, fear mongered by these little articles. Yeah, no, definitely. And and one other thing is that it really hasn't shown anything that was uh dangerous right the, i think the worst thing that would happen to you is you have to buy a new compass mm -hmm. i worry <laughs> if, I feel like it, if it happens it. i feel like it'll be much very if if, if we knew what mm -hmm. was about to happen i think it would be like a y2k moment because everyone would be like oh my god all of our planes are gonna fall out of the sky i don't i don't think that would be it because i feel no. like we could still birds would we, just some birds would fly north or some some birds would fly north when they were supposed to fly south, and, and vice versa. Is it magnetic in their heads? Is that what some of them do? That's a it's a trait of, evol of evolution that some of them have a bit of a bit of like um, how do I want to say substances materials in their beak or in their skull that kind of allows them to understand what's magnetic north. That's uh, insane. Some of them, some of them, not. They're going to get so birds. confused. Oh man, it'd be very I interesting. Like, yeah. I think that you know. GPS, the way that we have GPS working now, it's satellites. Like we'll be, we will be fine as far as our satellites go yeah. and understanding where we are geographically. I think our planes are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But if you have like a, a plain regular compass, yeah, you're going to you're gonna have to, you know, adjust your, adjust your compass, turn it upside, turn it upside down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, geodesics have nothing to do with the Earth's magnetic pole. So yeah. you're okay. Um, awesome. Good to have clarified that. Yes. Would you like to move on and talk about some of the, I guess, <clears throat> the the evidence to this now? Let's see. Oh, wait, here, here. There we go. I knew this was the next one. So mapping the plates, like what you were talking about. This mm -hmm. is kind of like what they came up with over time, correct? Yeah. So and where the association the, of earthquakes. Yeah, where the earthquakes lined up, it's pretty much exactly where all of these plate boundaries are. And mm -hmm. that's where a plate, you know, ends. And it's a different, different plate. But there's all kinds of different motion interactions happening at all these different plates. So you might mm -hmm. see areas that have a lot of earthquakes versus areas that don't have that many earthquakes. So if you look, um, you know, in between North America, Europe, South America, Africa, there's earthquakes, but they're not like as strong. They're not like major, major earthquakes. But then, some, then you you look at the the plate boundary that goes along the western part of the americas you know california the san andreas fault is a plate boundary you know part of mm -hmm. california is on a completely different tectonic plate and i was lucky enough to go beyond both parts i visited mm -hmm. a different tectonic plate last week when i was in california i got to go like i got to go see the san andreas fault it was super it was super cool but in different kinds of plate boundaries you have like very, you know, uh, in, intense plate interactions. So that's why in those areas, you'll get really intense, very strong earthquakes because there might be collision happening there, a subduction zone or just, you know, any kind of um, convergent plate boundary. But we'll talk about the different kinds of plate boundaries um, in a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So 
would you like to move on and talk about the, I guess, the evidence to uh, what both Alfred and Marie kind of, I don't know, progress to, right? Kind of the next, the next step. The seeing fossil assemblages match up on, you know, two different continents. That was something that was observed by Wegener early on mm -hmm. that and um, like geological form formations kind of matching up in different areas. So you're seeing the same, the same rock essentially in both areas um mm. in addition to that i mean uh that was that was kind of the extent of that at the time much later um looking at volcanic activity that's also telling you something about you know different plate boundaries have different kinds of volcanic activity at a you know um the mid-ocean ridges you know in the atlantic ocean that's volcanic there's new mm. There's new rock being formed there in the form of of this really, really, you know, pure. I guess pure or um, I guess pure isn't the right word. It's 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 mafic, and that's a word that we use for igneous rocks that have a lot of um, darker minerals. So basalt, you know, that's what's forming in the in the oceans, and that's what's happening at the the spreading regions. So that's new rock being formed there. In addition to that, um, on areas where you have converging plate boundaries, you're also seeing vol volcanoes pop up like on the continent because mm -hmm. there's all kinds of like melting going on. That's a little bit more complicated, but tsunamis were also, you know, you observe that because you're seeing earthquakes happen in the middle of the ocean. You're like, well, why are the earthquakes happening in the middle of the ocean? And why are we getting tsunamis on the shores here? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's pretty much that for the evidence that we'd used. Um, I guess uh, understanding like the volcano aspect, I think came a little bit after we'd already proved it. We were like, oh, now that makes sense. Now that lines up. Mm -hmm. But I Extra think that was the all the, that was all the evidence, I think, until we started to really have more of a, of a deeper understanding. Once we accepted like, this is definitely a thing, there was more research going in and trying to figure out what the driving force was. Because that's yeah. what kept Wagner from really proving the theory at the time and for it to be taken seriously. Because he didn't understand what was driving it. And for a really long time, and I, I was taught this in um, earth science in high school, that it was the convection within the mantle um, that pull, uh, you know, pushes apart the plates and it, and it moves them in different directions but that's not the whole story. I mean, that's what they taught us. It was very basic. This is, I think, like 2013. But there is like a little bit more of a, of a deeper um, understanding to it. And it's evolving, you know, every passing year with more and more research that goes into this because it's such an interesting thing. And it's fairly new. Like it's a fairly new thing um, within, you know, our understanding of the earth because this is only like 50 years ago that this became accepted. That's so exciting. And uh, we're going to talk about that whenever we come back from our first commercial break. So stick around and find out. All right, we're back here for segment two, and we're going to be talking about plate movement. So this is an exciting part. This is the the pretty much the how and why thing goes on. We, we kind of talked a little bit about the story and the evidence and, and whatnot. So let's get into the mechanics of plates. Super exciting. So Kate, why do the plates move? It took us a long time to figure it out, and we're still further calibrating what we know, but it has to do with mantle convection and also other interactions in the mantle. All kinds of stuff is going on, and it's more than just one thing. So continental drift, you know, the theory of continental drift involves just plates moving apart from each other you know, because there was new material being, you know, I guess, created in between the continents and then it spread apart and that was low elevation. So it became, you know, filled with water and it was an ocean. But there are other things going on that Wagner didn't exactly consider um, because, you know, Pangaea was part of his theory, the, you know, big supercontinent that all of these you know, the continents where they are now had spread apart from. But did he consider 
how Pangea was made because it had to do with not just spreading in areas, but collision in other areas. So there are two parts to, I guess, plate movement, and that is ridge push. And that happens at the, um, you know, these divergent boundaries uh, where you have spreading going on, like at the mid-ocean ridges. That is convection coming up from the mantle and pushing the two halves, you know, pushing those two plates apart from each other from the center. And then there's also a pull happening on the other end, because mm -hmm. where are those, where's the other end of that plate going? It is probably crashing into another continent, or it's sinking underneath another continent in the, in the situation of um, oceanic plates, which are more dense than the continental plates where we live on the con you know the continents <laughs> so what's happening there is once you get that you know that part of a plate sinking underneath another one it's sinking it's pulling as well so you have push in one spot pull in another it is like having a um a oh hmm, i think a piece of paper on a table and then you're pushing it off the table and you know there is the force of you pushing it off the table but then after some point there's also gravity that if you let go the you know gravity would be pulling that piece off the edge so mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like that I mean there isn't really a letting go part but those two forces are working together you know and it, it that's ridge push and slab pull density kind of winning over right the mm -hmm. uh, sinks and then at it kind of works as a pool until it it undergoes so much pressure and heat that then it just kind of almost dissolves yes yeah, so that does That's happen it. um it's not so much a dissolving or a melting i mean there is you know depending on if there is a lot of hydration a lot of water in that plate that's getting subducted um, this is also how we get uh, volcanics happening on a continent next to a, a plate boundary. So this is why the the Andes Mountains, for example, there was a lot of volcanic activity there because the the you know uh, Pacific plate is subducting underneath there. So that plate is going somewhere and it's you know melting underneath the continent on top of it, on underneath the Andes Mountains. Now, some of that plate melts if mm -hmm. there are the if it's you know it all depends about the angle that it's going in at if the yeah. rock has lots of water you know mo water mo mo molecules bonded to everything because the presence of water can reduce the melting temperature so it might not have to go too deep or have too much pressure before it melts it's a whole thing but that's how you get um volcanics happening at those at those areas but yeah. Yes, so there is metamorphism that happens at subduction zones, and mm -hmm. that's how we get rocks and minerals um, like blue schist. You can only get blue schist happening in a subduction zone. That, that gets into um, really complicated, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's petrology, it's, it's, it's igneous and metamorphic petrology, which is complicated to a lot of people, including myself. I, I had a really hard time <laughs> learning about that, but retrograde pro prograde motion and subduction there's lots of stuff going on there that i can't really explain without diagrams that we did not <laughs> prepare i didn't think we were going to be going into that but yeah Sorry. you can have metamorphism happening there and you know that rock depending on how the slab decides to move forward mm -hmm. maybe that metamorphic rock just goes into the mantle and it's never seen and then sometimes it can wind up, you know, mm -hmm. getting wedged and stuck. And then we wind up seeing it and we're like, oh, hey, look, blue schist. You That's should exciting. not have survived. You should have been in the mantle. How did you <laughs> get here? And it's really exciting. I have a piece of blue schist and it feels like I'm getting like, like a, a mistake, you know? That's awesome. No, I, sorry. That's just my, my physics brain. I want to take a, a problem and bust it open into like, 10 different concepts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right in the sense that like if there is pulling happening, 
Um, mm-hmm. It's not so much like a stretching pull like you're thinking of, because yeah. um, that does happen in in other areas. Uh, but like pulling uh, doesn't typically make metamorphic rocks. It's not like it's not like the pulling aspect. It's it's the you know, pressure that makes it. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's the force. pressure and temperature and mm-hmm. how long it goes on for the available mm-hmm. materials to make new minerals out of, and that's what metamorphism is is the you know recycling of existing ingredients to make mm-hmm. something new out of um an assemblage of minerals you know, a rock so that's that's like a whole that that's a whole thing in and of itself mm-hmm. and also yes like as also you get you have that initial heat um and then as you be, as you become cer- like a certain density that it's just sustaining and then it'll die out yeah mm-hmm. there was exactly. some new research on this um recently actually and i didn't i did a an analysis of this paper on my podcast and i was able to like look into this headline that i saw a lot that was about you know the earth the earth's core is cooling very fast like the earth's core is cooling breaking news we already knew that um (laughs) but this paper was saying that you know it's it according to the their their research that the core was cooling faster than we initially estimated but it doesn't mean anything for us humans on our time scale we're not going to be around to see the earth solidify we're not going to be around to see the sun go out or to see our solar system fall into a black hole we're gonna we're gonna kill ourselves way before that happens it's gonna be our own fault i would be honored if we if we were taken out by some cool natural force but it's probably going to be human conflict Mm. (laughs) that would really suck It'll definitely be human induced yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, that is, is it, it is heat dissipating heat that is not being created. It's just mm-hmm. continuous heat and it's like a boiling pot of water. So yeah. it is, you know, heat pooling up from the bottom going around the top. That's essentially how it was explained to me. Absolutely. So let's move on to how do the plates move? Well, there are three different types of plate boundaries. We have a convergent plate boundary where two plates are crashing into each other in some way. They're being controlled by ridge push in another area on the other end of that plate. Uh, But then they're also being controlled if it's a subduction zone by slab pull. So you can have two kinds of, um, you can actually have three kinds of convergent boundaries. You can have where there's two continental plates crashing into each other because mostly of um, ridge push on both uh, opposite ends of those plates. You can have a oceanic plate colliding with a continental plate in which the oceanic plate always goes underneath because it is so much more dense. It's made up of all that mafic rock, that mafic uh, igneous rock, basalt, and that stuff is always going to be more dense than whatever, you know, the mafic rock which is different it's it's it's, it's the opposite side um that the continents are made of so it's always gonna sink underneath um and then you can have a uh two oceanic plates that are colliding in that case whichever one is older um is is going to go under because it as plates age they get more and more dense so a really old oceanic plate is going to subduct underneath a younger oceanic plate um, but that's not as simple as it gets. There isn't just move away and move together because <laughs> there are different angles of this happening. And sometimes you get two plates that are, you know, one of them is moving in one direction because it's colliding or it's being spread on one end of it. And then another one next to it is having different interactions and they're in different directions. That's where you get transform boundaries. So uh, the the most understandable one for people in the U.S. is um, California and the San Andreas Fault because that is a transform plate boundary. There are there are plates that are having all kinds of weird interactions, and the best part is that these boundaries are often not straight. They're like wiggly, crazy little lines. I mean, they're I mean, they follow a general trend, but they're not like completely straight lines. So there are parts of the San Andreas Fault and of this plate boundary where there is plates that are moving together and there's subduction. And there's also parts where it's like sliding against each other and it's creating, you know, earth earthquakes there. 
there's all kinds of cool interactions happening on that fault. I was so, that was so cool. That I got to go see it. I'm really mad that I didn't feel an earthquake though. I was really disappointed. I was hoping like to go see the San Andreas fault and maybe I'd feel an earthquake, but no, I've never felt an earthquake in my life. And I went to the place and it wasn't there. No. Devastating. <laughs> there should I'm have sure just been one. People are like listening to this and going, oh. I think I'll take my chance. <laughs> no, they're they're minor. They're so minor. And people in California are definitely used to them. I got to hang out with two of my earthquake geologist friends and they were taught they were telling me all about it. They keep track of earthquakes. One of them has a like a literal seismometer in his office, like at his house. Ooh. And I'm like, this is this is cool. You just like yeah. peeled back your carpet. You have a literal seismometer there and it's got pretty little lights on it. That's awesome. Like it was well. They, they don't look like they, like the big spool of paper with the needle on it. They're like <laughs> they're like cool little gadgets now, and they have like funky like neon lights if you want them to. It's like customizing a computer. It was so so cool, and they literally keep track of all the seismic activity that happens in the area. And there are tons of little minor minor shakes that happen along that fault. But I was there, and none of them happened devastated i have no idea what an earthquake feel feels like they were explaining it to me and i'm like all right so it's just like a little bit of like feeling like i'm like swaying a little bit dude i have vertigo i feel like that feel like that all the time how am i gonna know if there was an earthquake or not i i, I already feel like like i'm swaying most of the time oh. sucked <laughs> but yeah those are the different kinds of plate boundaries um I'm and sorry. Is... I was just thinking about your uh, your friend and just how he could totally nerd out and just be like, oh, come over did. and see my seismograph. <laughs> we did. It was super, super cool just to like nerd out. They took me to the San Andreas Fault and like both of them had been like one of them had been there before. He's, he's a professor. So he takes the students there. One of them had never seen that part of it. And I'm like coming from the East Coast. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because on the East Coast of the United States, we don't have any plate boundaries. We don't really have any plate activity. We live on a, 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 a passive margin, which means that where the ocean meets the continent, there is no plate boundary. There's nothing really going on there. As compared to the West Coast, it's, it's, it's an active margin because there's a whole tectonic you know, uh, plate bound boundary there. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff going on. But on the East Coast, no. Nah. We had that one little like shake and what is it, 20, 2011? That was like nothing. I didn't even feel it. I was so I was so mad. Yeah, I grew up in Pennsyl Pennsylvania, so um, wasn't really feeling anything there. You might have felt that it was around. It was like it was like in like the like the the, the tri-state area, like New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I'm pretty sure like people felt it around there. I think it was actually it. in. It might have like originated in. A little bit further south of that, I want to say Maryland. I'm not really sure. Mm, okay, yeah, that that makes sense. No, I, I unfortunately didn't feel it. That that would have been, Rats. yeah, it would have been super cool. <laughs> but so the last question, maybe for for this segment, is just kind of talking about the speed in which these plates move. And we obviously know, just talking already, that it it can get pretty complex or or mm -hmm. very variable is a better term. Very Absolutely. Variable. So there is a lot of history that we're able to look at and, you know, obviously looking at the different ages of the rock in the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic, we can find out the spreading rate from that. That is like the perfect place to look, but that's only telling us the rate of, of, of motion for that boundary in that one part of that boundary because it gets so complex in all these different areas. And then again, you know, looking at the, the uh, ages of the different rocks along these, you know, the opposite sides of the ridge and looking at the magnetism there, it's, it's hard to say, you know, how fast it was going at that time because otherwise we wouldn't we don't have like another way to 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 tell how long things were you know how how long the magnetic poles were aligned in that way so it's 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 kind of hard to like it, you can't really cross reference and find out the speed at that point or the speed for this frame of time so it gets a little 
you know, choppy. If it, it, we have like a general idea of where the plates used to be um, and a general time frame that we're able to line up with things like fossil assemblages and, you know, um, the geological formations, the ages of those. So we have like a pretty a pretty solid time frame. It's not anywhere near exact. But, you know, we're looking at, at like, you know, a scale of hundreds of millions of years. Um, and it, it, it doesn't get super specific, but it's, it's pretty specific. Looking at like geologic time as a whole, like half, like 500,000 years of like an error margin. That's, that's pretty fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's very good. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of time, whenever we come back from this commercial break, we're going to be talking about a timeline on plate tectonics. So where good. did it come from? How did it start? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, segment three. This is it. We both got our beers. We're ready to go. <laughs> uh, Kate, do you mind explaining the, the whole beer glass, if you don't mind? Or just oh, showing yes. it off? Yes, I have... A very, very cool beer glass. This is like a geologist's perfect gift. If you have a geologist in your life and you want to get them something, get them a beer glass that has the geologic time scale on it. I got this from a website called Cognitive Surplus, and it has the geologic time scale in um, like numerical age, the names of all the different periods, the um, major events that that you know separate the different um, you know, parts of geologic time, like mass extinctions, the appearance of human life, the, you know, ice ages. And there's also a bunch of fossils on the side where you can see like, oh, hey, look, this is where uh, trilobites existed. And that's where trilobites stopped existing. And it's really, really cool to see like where they pop up. And it, it, when I'm when I'm giving a lesson and I'm using this class, I kind of like use it as a little like cheat sheet. I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, yep, that was during the uh, the Jurassic <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Or you should just make your own brand of uh, of geologic glasses and then sell. Oh them. no, I love I love these though. <laughs> I'm I'm I, I keep forgetting. I should probably email that company and ask them to sponsor me because I I talk about their glass every yeah. single time I'm using it. Definitely, um, definitely. That's awesome. Heck yeah. Yeah, but speaking of geologic time, there mm. is a. This is, I, I want to look at the beginning of geologic time, you know, the beginning of plate tectonics, because they weren't always there. We didn't always have plates. The earth did not look the way it does now. And we, you know, obviously know that because the, we discovered the plates did not used to be in these positions. Those plates didn't exist at, you know, we're, we're not just recycling the same land. Some of them, we do have some really, really old pieces of rock that exist from these very ancient times, very, very early plate material. But a lot of our plates are newer stuff. So we yeah. have to kind of like wind back the clock and try to piece together what the earth looked like when those original plates were there, how those plates formed. And to do that, we have to, we have to go look at the beginning of the, of the earth, which is around 4.6 billion years ago when the earth had just been um, accumulating, like mm -hmm. um, I explained it before, like a like a Roomba attached to a string. So it's just like going around in a circle and at the center of this, yeah, at the end of the string is, you know, the sun. So it's just picking up all this dust, you know, along its path, along this circular path. And that's what all the different planets did to, you know, create the planets. Um, it's called planetary accretion, by the way. But I do like the Roomba or um, dust dust bunny, like the 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 <laughs> dust the dust bunny explanation. I really do enjoy because it it's the dust bunny gets bigger every single time. Mm. Now, what the dust bunny does not do is be made of molten rock. Um, <laughs> so as the Earth was colliding with all these different pieces, it is there's a lot of of friction obviously a lot of energy being created so every time it collides and this is what you were mentioning earlier i think you had a little bit of like um you were on the right track mm -hmm. so there is not like particle collision happening within the earth now that keeps it warm or you know creates the heat all that heat was created during this time period when everything was um 
when everything was kind of dust bunnying and collecting and it was smacking yeah. into all these different things, that's where all that heat was created. So now we're looking at a giant floating ball of lava in space. And that is what the earth was. And at, you know, over a little bit of time, it started to cool and it created this outer crust, like a burnt marshmallow. And it's got this like black outer crust on it. And you can kind of like pinch it with your fingers and like move it a little bit. And then there's like the piece in the middle that's not quite gooey enough. And it's like, oh, I'm going to bite into this. I'm going to bite into this. And it's going to be like still like solid in the middle. And I don't want that. That's kind of what the earth was like during the Hadean. There was very a relatively thin layer of very, very young, brand new, pure basaltic rock on the outside of the earth. And that's all that it was. We didn't have, you know, a lot of differentiation going on. There wasn't a whole lot of like movement. I mean, there was just an outer shell and uh, lots of lots of lava cracks. It was pretty, pretty cool. If you can, you know, I think the, the burnt marshmallow thing really, um, yeah. really does it does it justice that's the one that like i was taught about and i i it, that stuck with me this entire time was i i think it's a perfect explanation yeah but the great analogy. time time went on and that rock was just nothing really changed about it it was the same composition there was nothing really new being added to it or nothing new being created with it until we got water water came after and that's when we started to see some different stuff happening because then we had oceans and Things got more complicated. As time went on, we started to create different kinds of rock, had, you know, other interactions going on. And that's where we kind of move into the Archean, which is another eon. Um, I should mention the, the, like the Hadean was a really, really long period of time. <laughs> Let me go look and see what it is. Hang on. Let's go see. Oh, is, does it does it show me? Okay, so the Hadean actually is kind of the Hadean's kind of funky because it's not usually like considered to be its own thing. We don't have like an exact amount of time that it lasted. The Hadean is like pre geologic time because we don't really have rocks from before that. We don't. Okay. The kind of it's complicated. <laughs> The Hadean went from 4.6 billion years ago to about 4 billion years ago. After that, we had the Archean, which lasted a little bit less time. So we're looking at like a really long amount of time. Jesus. The Proterozoic is is more than half of all geologic time, but we like put it like equal on like a time scale, just, just for visual sake. Anyways... I'm getting all emotional about ge geologic time. I get so excited whenever I see this glass and just like, ah, geologic time. It's insane. It's so hard to fathom it. But here we go. I'm trying to explain it without like a lot of visual. Okay. So you move on to the Archean and that's where we start to see like, I guess, appearances changing in rock. And there were all these like, not like they were kind of like mounds almost because now we're having like volcanics going on. It was getting very, very funky. And then after a certain point, and I couldn't tell you what point it was that we started to see like, like what we think of today, like our kind of plate interactions where there are larger plates rather than just these little individual cracks, these little burnt marshmallow cracks. Um, we're start starting to see like, like, I guess, big shapes larger masses of 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 rock that are interacting together with i guess in in contrast with other large masses of rock and that those those were the first tectonic plates and that led to eventually um those different plates having you know varying interactions like the first mountain building events the first um like Yes, yeah, it was mountain building events and, and collisions. And then around 1 billion years ago, we had the first supercontinent because there were supercontinents before Pangaea. Pangaea is not the end all be all. It's not the super cool one. I don't even think it's that cool. It's whatever, whatever. Everyone's like, reunite Pangaea. But what about Rodinia? I want to reunite Rodinia, please. Rodinia was the first supercontinent. And that was 
made up of all these tinier land masses that were starting to like become larger continents. And Mm -hmm. that's where we have a lot of like our really, really old mountain, like mountain ranges um, that exist today, but not as mountains, but as like remnants of mountains because they're so old, they've just been grinded down or they're buried deep underneath other rocks that have formed Mm -hmm. since then. But we have evidence of them to know when these things happen, which is really, really um, important. So that was the first supercontinent. After that, we get um, more motion and all these land masses. We had the introduction of Laurentia, Gondwana. Um, there was another one that had a funky name. I think we're on the next slide at this point. Yes. You can show that. I was going to say that one is. Penosha. Was yeah. It, was it Penosha. And yeah. Penosha. Okay. I actually have not heard of that one until today. I'd only ever heard of Rodinia and Pangea. And then the other like larger land masses like Laurentia and Gondwana and then Gondwana land, which was another one. That, mm. You know, Gondwana combined with something else. There's lots of, lots of different names for these, for these yeah. things. And you can also see like the names were kind of, not like kept because these names didn't exist before we gave names to places that exist today. But, you know, the, Mm -hmm. you know, Laurentia is like what North America is, what much of North America is. And during the last ice age, there was a huge ice sheet that we called the Laurentide ice sheet. Oh yeah. Comparing it to that, you know, using the same, using the same name. Um, But those were, those were, colliding with each other and they were also having like rotational stuff going on so if you look at like a map of like the i guess the current placement of the continents on top of past placements it's not going to make a lot of sense if you're just looking to arrange the puzzle pieces and drag them and they're all staying the same orientation because things were rotating and that's another way that we found out that plate tectonics was happening and that plates were like rotating orientation um because those alignments those magnetic alignments that happen in all kinds of rocks that have metal in them Mm -hmm. we can look at these rocks on different continents and we're like all right this should be pointing north but right now it's not pointing north (laughs) and that was because when that rock formed all that time ago it was pointing north, but now that whole continent got rotated and moved. There's also the thing about polar wandering. That's That makes it more complicated, but in a very general, general sense, yeah, we can see that there have been land masses that are not facing the same way that they used to be when they formed. So that further added some more, like, I guess intrigue and um complexity to you know our understanding of plate tectonics and the motion oh god there's been so many so many collisions separations collisions reorientations subductions new things being formed when an ocean opens up you know you're creating um the basement rock which is basalt at a mid-ocean ridge but then you're also creating an ocean um a a sedimentary basin where you can make sedimentary rocks so you're creating new rock there too and then if that ocean closes up because of you know collision Mm -hmm. you get those rocks are still there if there's two continents colliding you're going to get those rocks becoming scrunkled and forming a mountain yep and then that's how you get these like um i don't think that's is it i I wouldn't call it synclines kind of deal Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is part, part of that. You can get that whenever you have, um, you can get that at collisions, but you can also have it happen when there is like some pulling happening, things can kind of like fault and sometimes they sag, but for the most part, it's during collisions when you have scrunkling, like, uh, I get, I got these, here we go. Oh, I can't. This is not mine. I can't. I can't use this. <laughs> Rats. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Um, I, I would use. I normally I use a book, but these are my boyfriend's like nice books. 
And most of them are hardcover, which ruins it. I can't do any of my demonstrations with hardcover books, which is a bummer. Yeah. Anyways, I think think the word scrunkle does a pretty good job of it. Yeah, but there's but there's more than that. It's like all kinds of like there's so much more to it. It's like an accordion. Yeah. But if an accordion was getting really, really messed up. Oh. (laughs) I can't uh, I can't do it very well. Yeah, that's 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 literally it. That's how weird it is. Depending on the speed and the force mm-hmm. coming from one side of the of the plate, from one plate in one yeah. collision, yeah, it can be completely. It can be so oblique. It's not always straight on, and that's mm-hmm. how you get all these really, really weird shapes in rock. And let me tell you, structural geologists are on some other shit. For being able to comprehend that and be a, be a detective millions and millions of years ago to understand what that thing looked like, why it looks the way it does now. It's insane. That is, it's such a very complex thing to understand and piece together because no one yeah. saw it happen. But we have all this proof that it did. We just want to know why. And we right. have lots of proof showing us how and why piecing it all together is another story yeah it's so so much fun though the way that we define our plate boundaries is entirely dependent on how recent like the motion was at those boundaries so there are a lot of points within the united states that used to be plate bound boundaries yeah like uh, especially up in Canada, there's a lot of like different stuff going on in Canada. A lot of really, really old material, mm-hmm. um, different um, cratons. See, that's a word I really don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly. It's C R A T O N, and I've only ever heard like one professor pronounce it, and he said craton. But then I've I watched some videos before this because I've never said it out loud since then, and I could only find British people saying it, and they were saying craton, and I'm like. That must be a regional thing because there's no mm. way it's Grattan. Yeah. yeah it's, that's it's, it's, it's because of their accent, I think. I don't think it's called Grattan. Craton yeah. sounds a little too sci-fi. Uh-huh. There's got to be an in-between. Anyways, there are really, really old like blocks of rock, like just masses of, of continent that mm-hmm. were from these super older continents and those were like original rock, you know, not. Yeah. So yeah. So like there are fused, pieces, but they just, they just exist. That's inactive. Yes. Of. So yeah. yeah, they are. That mm. is pretty much what happened. It, 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 it is a lot of fusion happening there too, because okay. you also have, mm. you know, at some areas where there's collision, you know, you're having volcanics as well. Yeah. A lot of stuff going on. I mean, fu- fusing rock together. It's a, it's not really a term that we use because it doesn't really apply in that yeah. way. Rock is just stuck together sometimes. They exist that... together. They're friends now. That's it. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah. is it? Am I right by saying that? So like they do kind of get bigger because of this yeah, stick together? I, guess. I think yeah, of it yeah, like – I suppose. Think of it there's, like there's a, green there's a lot boundaries. of plates. There's a lot of plates in the on the earth right now other than just the really big ones that we you know, um, focus on. You can even say that there are, you can divide those plates into being multiple ones. And it's all, it's, it's a lot of um, semantics, I guess. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of what we call micro plates. So those are interacting with our big plates too. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much the, I guess, the hot button where everybody gets excited. Yeah, Pangea. Pangea. <laughs> yes. So... There are a bunch of continents that are coming together, different land masses, volcanic island arcs, all colliding together just because the plate boundaries had aligned in such a way over time that eventually everything is going to converge on the opposite side of of the earth. If spreading keeps happening in the Atlantic Ocean the way it is, eventually we're probably going to meet on the other side of the earth and we're all just going to be connect- connected. Um, that'll be a long, long time from now. But this did happen again. So after Rodinia happened, it happened later on and um, forming Pangea. Now, this is like 
the closest thing that we have. Like this is the one that we can really, really tell with most accuracy what it looked like. Um, because moving further back, it's really hard to tell. Um, but because a lot of the shapes are just really, really similar, Pangea is mm -hmm. a bit easier to reconstruct. But this is around, um, let me go look at my little time scale. I like to know like what like 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 the dates of them of them are. Oh, you actually wrote it down. The Paleozoic. The Paleozoic yeah. was um when you saw Pangea, and that's when it was formed. Mm -hmm. But it was still together. It was a yeah. raging success. They had a ton of fans. They were really, really successful until they broke up. And we can actually pinpoint when Pangea started to break up by looking at the oldest, oldest mafic, um, the oldest basalt in the Atlantic Ocean. Because we're like, That's oh, cool. well, we can tell at, at, at least for that part, we mm -hmm. can tell when that started to break up because of the age of that mid-ocean ridge basalt. That's very, awesome. Very exciting. I love, I love that little like, tidbit of information. I don't know. I, I, I used to know the exact number. I don't. I really wish that I did. But um, there are other parts where there was rifting going on, where it was breaking up in these different areas. And they'll happen at different times, but for the most part, like we attribute the like breaking up of Pangea to be like somewhere during like the Triassic, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I th uh, that here, maybe that would help. In the Mesozoic Eon, the breakup of Pangea. Yes. Yeah. Go. Right around there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you have the Permian. And then it goes, what, into the Triassic between 225 and 200? I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, plus or minus some range of millions of years. But yes. So close enough. Close um, enough, yeah. This was, this was dinosaur time. So imagine the dinosaurs um, existing across all these different continents and, you know, being able to trace those fossils back. This is how we were able to find this out. This is one of, like, the biggest things – because dinosaur fossils were, you know, fairly easy to identify and be like, oh, this is a very specific species that exists in both South America and Africa. And that was something that I think is like really, really cool. I'm, I'm not much of a dinosaur person. Actually, the fossils that I enjoy are like really, really old um, clams <laughs> and and like cousins of clams. I, cool. I'm very much a big Devonian Solar Solarian fan or or division. I love I love the Paleozoic. It's my favorite. I don't really care about dinosaurs. Mm, I just I like my to. I just like my little clams. So it's harder for those because those existed in the ocean and they existed in many, many different oceans. Yeah. But with dinosaurs, you know, they were restricted for the most part to the land and that was a really good ind indicator. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of trilobites. I, oh I yeah, trilobite over there. <laughs> See, I collection. wish I, I wish I was more into trilobites. It's, I think it's because I just haven't seen a lot of them in the field. I have, I've seen a trilobite twice in the field in my study re, re, in my study region, um, but I have not successfully found like an entire one, like one that was fully, uh, oh. is what we call articulated. It has all of the parts still intact because a lot of the times when trilobites died. It was because they fell apart in weird ways. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, the trilobites went extinct in a really, really funny way. I could talk about that, but like that's like a whole other story. <laughs> Understood. So the last bit of this is going to be talking about – because really we can kind of understand what has brought us to present day, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, the separation of or the breakup of Pangea that's separated into the continents that we have at the moment. Um, but maybe we could talk about just the, I, I want to say near future, near future in geologic time. So like yeah. less than 50 million years to start. So maybe you can take us through some of the predictions. Or not so predictions, I guess, just it's like a what we're seeing. For a forecast a looking, forecast. Um, a, a projection. A projection is probably the like like the I think like the better word for it. So, mm -hmm. following the current motion of the plates as they are now and as they have been moving since the breakup of Pangaea, because they've also changed over that time, we've had reorientation of things. We've had 
a lot of of failed we had we had like sometimes you can have these things called failed rifts where something would have broken up but it didn't quite and you got like volcanic activity there instead fun stuff mm. um cool. there is a way that we're kind of able to like project where the plates are going now and eventually they will meet up on the other side of the world maybe no not exactly in in the in the middle but because you have to account for antarctica as well which is just yeah. it's all the way down it's all the way down there but there okay. there are like some ideas of what that new supercontinent would be called and people are like oh yeah pan pangea too super pangea I don't care. She's had her moment. Give it another <laughs> cool name. What yeah. we 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 couldn't call Pangea Ro Rodinia two, Rodinia the second, Super Rodinia. No. So if if she doesn't get that kind of recognition, then Pangea doesn't deserve it either. I think it should have a cooler name. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> throw <laughs> it out the there. Throw, my head. throw an idea out there. Oh, gosh, I don't. I wouldn't even be. I wouldn't even know where to start from that. It have to be something with a uh, Ia or Inya, I think, at the end. It would be. I, I don't know if I want to go too off, but something interesting because we had Pinocha, uh, Rodinia, uh -huh. uh, Pangea. I, I think maybe doing something with Ia would be. It cool. should be a. It should be a pop culture reference. That that would be funny as hell. Oh. And it would be really, really funny, like how all those people who named their kid after like the Game of Thrones character who wound up sucking really bad. Um, like, imagine how funny it would be if we gave that like a name from pop culture, like to like yeah. honor them, and then like things just went bad. Like the people who like named like a fruit fly after Beyonce. Mm -hmm. What if what if she does what if she does something unspeakable? What are they, what are they going to do with that fruit fly's name? I don't even know. Beyonce. <laughs> I, don't know. I, there, I, I don't know if that's like the exact like I know that there ha that has no happened. I was saying that's not maybe that's it's a thing. bee oh I think it might be a kind of bee that's named named after Beyonce that'd be kind of funny yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well even think about this right so we're trying to name something that's way over 50 million years into the future yeah we might not even be here so what does it even oh no matter? no we're not we are yeah, not gonna be there matter? But it's funny. That's that's yeah, why we yeah. can give it like it's a, a stupid meme. name because it yep. doesn't even matter. We're not gonna see it. We're just we're just having fun thinking about it. We're um, you know, maybe we'll put all of our research onto like a spacecraft and send it off into nowhere. So when like aliens come around <laughs> and they come look at our planet and they're like, "Whoa, this is a mess. All yeah. of your rocks are made of plastic. It looks <laughs> bad." There's like, um, what is this? A fossilized shake weight in the mix here. Um, yeah. Like, I think that would be hilarious to look at the future and look forward, not look forward to it, but like, I think it would be cool mm -hmm. if aliens came here in like 200 million years and saw that we had mountain ranges, like new mountain ranges. We had sedimentary rocks that were made, you know, with plastic and they look the way that, you know, it's it's it blows my mind, and it mm. sucks that that's our future. But we will be gone from our own devices. But it will be really, really cool to think yeah. about what the Earth is going to look like because of us. Yeah, it's gonna suck, mm -hmm. but it would look so cool. Oh, yeah. Life will be gone, but the rocks will be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. With even just uh, predicting that, say, humans for some odd reason or some conscious being of, for some odd reason makes it to this time where you get this stuff. Sorry, let me push to the next page if it. Yeah. So oh, these, here's some names. Yeah. These uh, names, the uh, Orica, Erica, Orica, or Orica, Orica. Uh, kind of like that Ultima. one. That's not bad. No. Nova, Nova Pangea, no. Mm -mm. Amasia, I've maybe. I've heard I've heard Neo Pangea. Neo Pangea. So like the, the different the different names. Um, I'm actually hearing two, three of these for the first time. Um, that all depends on like what different possibilities that yeah. there could be. You yeah. know, um, what this 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 Orica one is kind of interesting. I don't 
I don't know how that could happen where everything yeah. goes back to where it was. If, if, if it was, I think that is what would happen if there was like a reversal in mm. all of the plate boundaries and everything <laughs> just as is went back to where it would have been. But yeah. there's also like, different shapes that exist now it wouldn't have existed then and keeping right. the exact same shapes seems silly because they for wouldn't sure. actually be that way well, for florida sure. would be long gone florida shouldn't even be in that mm -mm. yeah mm -mm. florida florida's gonna be underwater and those those are gonna like dissolve i mean not dissolve but probably erode away into the Sorry, ocean florida. off the continental shelf yeah. yeah sorry florida you're already disappearing and we shouldn't slowly. be building anything more in florida we should yeah. stop building things in florida yeah make um, it a make it a, a historical landmark you can't change anything make a floating leave city. it as it is uh yeah. well where i was going with here was one thing that we didn't talk about and deals with volcanic activity is that a couple times in Earth's history, there's been major events from volcanic activity because of supercontinents joining together, where it's created some nasty implications in terms of almost wiping out a good portion of life. <gasps> oh, yeah. Like, um, oh, like Siberian snow traps. Snowball Earth, uh, Siberian traps. Like, it's it has created some crazy stuff. <laughs> so imagine if you live, not you, Imagine if uh, humans or some conscious being shows up or stays here uh, on Earth. They're going to have a, a wild time during the next supercontinent. Yeah. I th yeah. yeah. And it would be interesting, I mean, if there was a just like actual real-time accounts of that. I think that would be cool. But sadly, I won't be here. <laughs> oh maybe maybe like cosmic spirits if that's like a thing and i can just like float around space for eternity i'll go fuck around in some other parts of the universe and then like i'll look at my watch and i'm like ah time to go back and check on earth and go see what that shit looks like now because i've been dying to do that so i think that'd be really that, that, that would be kind of kind of cool oh yeah for sure so uh i think we've run the course of the future do you have any fun parting messages as a science communicator or just as an individual or, uh, man, just anything? You got anything good? Um, if anyone people? has any, if anyone has any cool ideas for the next supercontinent name, that um, I personally would love to hear them mm -hmm. because I think that these ones are not great. I think mm -hmm. that they could be better. Yeah, and I think that we should collectively vote on a name, like Ooh. how we voted on. I think I think the pop I think the population voted on naming Pluto. I think that was really? a real thing that happened. Really, man, did that I, backfire? <laughs> I don't. I don't think. It, I, mean, I think it's very very cool. Oh, I meant I meant like I meant the the status of the <laughs> of the body. <laughs> Not. The, I do love the name. The name is cool. Um, yeah, I gotta look yeah, at that. I gotta find out if that is actually a thing. Yeah, yeah. They're actually. I'm pretty sure that was what happened. They 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 named the new planet from like a like a poll slash contest almost. Mm, yeah, we should do that. that. We yeah. should do that. I think so. Why not? I think it'd be pretty. Who neat. do I have to email to make that happen? Yeah, right. Uh, hmm. That's very interesting. I think in the scientific community, at least in like the geologics like community, as far as like research goes, you just have to like do the research and then publish it and be like, all right, so um, here's my like reasoning. And then here's what I think we should name it and then publish it. And then if people agree with you, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? You know? I agree. Yeah. That'd be super so, cool. Let us know. I, I am oh, yeah. very curious on what you come up with. And don't take mine. <laughs> Mine's Beyonce, so that's mine. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the dumbest thing ever. It's it's got, it, it, it should be a meme name, just saying. Meme names mm. only. Meme names only. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Um, yeah. But do you, have any, do you have any advice for maybe someone who's doing science communication? Hmm. Um, if you 
have a lot of cool facts that you know about like your science or something that you're studying or something that you practice as like your job um and you can just talk about it and get so excited that the podcast that you're trying to record takes two hours um you may be a good you may have good potential to be a science communicator because if you're really really excited about something and you just go on and on and on you 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 probably have a lot of good things to say and mm -hmm. you should be teaching that to people agreed agreed well kate i've learned a lot and this i have has been too a great, this has been great that was a great podcast very fun i hope uh we've inspired someone to go out and do some geology research or just enjoy come up geology. with a name yeah you yeah. come up with a name uh <laughs> yeah this has been awesome i had a lot of fun mm -hmm. thank you thank you for being on the show thank you so much for having me i'm so glad that we worked this out with the, even with like like the timing the time time zone thing this was very very cool yes very cool oh my gosh consider what the time zones would have been in the past continental arrangements Ooh. I don't want to think about that. I, I I already think time zones are too complicated. I don't want to think about what they used to be. I don't I don't want to think about what time zone that New York used to be in 300 million years ago. I don't want to think about that. Nah, I'm good. I, I actually don't. I it was it was cool for it. a second until I started thinking. Then you're like, oh, daylight no. savings time. <laughs> <laughs> all right well this awesome. has been fantastic enjoy the rest of your night enjoy the rest of your of your beer i'll be enjoying mine and admiring the beautiful you know expanse of geologic time <laughs> same same i i likewise thank you so much and um have a good night all right you too rock on <laughs> that is all for this episode of everything steam now I'd like to give a big shout out to Kate for sharing her knowledge and vast expertise. And I highly recommend that you follow Kate at Rock Talk Kate on TikTok and at Groupie Geologist on Instagram. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make this show happen. This podcast was edited and produced by myself, marketed by Courtney Page and Maria Pusateri, QC'd by Panya Pitt Erickson, and our episode art was manifested by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against the algorithms. Again, I'd like to mention that we just kicked off our bi-weekly newsletter. We plan to preview the episode release of that week by giving out some facts from the recording, as well as some things we missed during the discussion. And here's a cool tidbit. You'll be able to reply to our newsletter with a question for the upcoming show. With that being said, moving forward, we will take one or two questions and attempt to address them during the show. So send us a question. We're looking forward to it. And lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and just fun Steam content. To do that, search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit to join in on the fun. And once again, thank you for listening to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. And as always, stay curious. <laughs>